Well, how about this for an idea? If most places on the planet, nature creates some sort of forest as its optimal sort of design solution, why doesn't our agriculture, if not literally look like a forest, function like a forest? This is none other than the co-founder of the concept of permaculture, David Holmgren. Uh, David is an environmental designer, activist, futurist, author, many more adjectives that is impossible to, to, to bring in together. And together we'll discuss what permaculture is, was, some of their principle, and how to develop permacultural principles in all urban and non-urban territories. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our societies, or in other words, their consumption of resources and their emissions of pollutions, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. With all that being said, David, thanks so much, uh, and welcome to the podcast. Uh, pleasure to join you. We've already had a fantastic uh, <laughs> discussion before the podcast. So I'm excited about what we will discuss. Uh, I want to give uh, the people who are uh, to the people who are listening and watching some context, um, meaning, of course, you have co-developed this concept with Bill Morrison in the 70s. Um, but can you take us back and let us know what was this period, this era like? Um, mm -hmm. So th there is, I have here a, a couple of points. You, you grew up in a radical political activist family, of course. There was the limits to growth. Uh, there was a rise of environmental movement. There was the political situation in Australia. There was the, this whole, you know, whole systems theory period as well. So th it was just a boiling period somehow. W what was it like to grow up and and live then? Oh, uh, well, of course, any... Uh, period people live through um, of extreme change in some ways is experienced as just natural or normal. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a period of great excitement uh, in a, a left political family after 23 years of conservative government, the most radical reformist government in Australia, a uh, Labor government under Gough Whitlam came to power in 1972 and changed almost everything at the same time on the steps of uh, the first energy crisis to hit the uh, affluent countries since the end of the Second World War uh, happened the following year, didn't hit Australia as hard as many places in Europe, but it was part of the whole uh, uh, fervour of environmental ideas, ideas in the counterculture, uh, that year was also, 1973, was the year of the Aquarius Festival in northern New South Wales, which was sort of part of the counterculture, back to the land uh, movement. But also in Tasmania, where I uh, was travelling around Australia as a, a young person, uh, having completed school in, in Western Australia and came across many of these ideas and uh, especially the environmental design school led by Barry McNeil in Hobart, which was a, the most radical experiment in tertiary education in Australia's history, as far as I can tell. And, you know, it was to train architects, landscape architects, urban planners, but without a curriculum based on the idea that the world is changing so fast that there's no point in teaching uh, design professionals a specific set of skills because by the time they come to practice, those skills will be irrelevant and you have to teach them how to problem solve and how to, to think. Uh, and so I joined that school in 74 where all of the radical dissidents and dropouts from all the <laughs> architecture, <laughs> landscape <laughs> architectural school all gathered in little Hobart, which Europeans might not understand. It's only a city of 120,000 people in a... Uh, the island state with only 500,000. So having all of the infrastructure of uh, democratic uh, society with only a population of 500,000, it, it was 
uh, an amazing time and where people were sort of very connected across academia, um, across environmental activism, uh, and very connected still to the rural roots of Tasmania being an, an extractive economy of hydroelectricity, forestry, mining, uh, agriculture, all of those uh, things. And, you know, meeting Bill Mollison, he was at the time a senior tutor in the psychology faculty, actually, at okay. the other institution. I never went to one of his lectures, but I was interested in his ecological thinking ideas and his background as a wildlife researcher who had been employed as an uneducated rabbit trapper by some of the top wildlife research scientists in Australia because they recognised how capable he was. So all of those things were happening at that time. And, of course, the European Green Movement has since recognised that Tasmania was the place where was one of the birthplaces of the modern green political uh, movement in the opposition to the damming of the, the last wild rivers. And Bill Mollison was involved in all of those uh, early campaigns um, and was connected to all, all of that uh, world that also overlapped with the, the most active um, organic farming uh, networks in Australia. We're also in Little Tasmania. So it was both a small hinterland place, uh, you know, like being in Corsica uh, or Nova Scotia in Canada or somewhere, uh, and yet there were all of these incredible creative uh, ideas and connections to the world happening there at that time. Yeah, that seems fantastic. This convergence of people, ideas, and 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 fights as well. I mean, struggles at the same time. It seems that uh, it was like being at the right place at the right time. Or, I mean, it's hard to say, as you say, it's it's easy to say when you're in the future, looking back, that this was mm. a turning point or a tipping point into something. But uh, why were you interested in environmental design? What was this? more of a sign of activism? Were you interested in architecture? What, what was... Uh, well, I, I was very interested in, in design and my initial interests were um, very much... I was a practical person with my hands and although I was a, an ideas person and uh, interested in theory, I was very oriented to uh, practical things and I was initially attracted to architecture and in some ways I would still regard myself as a more competent ecological builder than ecological farmer. But in that first generalist degree course in environmental design, by the end of the first year, my interests had gravitated around the, if you like, the profession of landscape architecture. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in the crossover between landscape architecture the science of ecology and the practice of agriculture where humans get their most important basic needs, uh, food and other things. And I could see how two of these intersected in various examples, but I couldn't find anywhere where all three came together. And it was around that time that I met Bill Mollison uh, through a chance uh, event that he was participating at um, and you know we got talking about what I was going to throw myself into in the second year of the course because I had total freedom to do whatever I wanted and that was that was um, uh, late 74 where the seed of the idea for the permaculture concept emerged and then our relationship was that of mentor to student but never a formal relationship and mm -hmm. we worked together and I crafted this manuscript which actually became the unpublished manuscript that I then used as my primary reference <laughs> in my thesis <laughs> slightly arrogant auto citing uh, yes as David um, Holmgren would say yeah <laughs> uh 
And uh, I then walked away from the second stage of that academic uh, course, which would have given me a professional level qualification to just get my hands on experience. And it, it was Bill in that phase who uh, encouraged me to hand the manuscript back to him and uh, he was ready to take these ideas to a larger stage than the university where he was. And in 76, we published a joint article um, and had did some interviews. And then we had this huge interest from publishers wanting to publish the manuscript that became Permaculture One. So that's my sort of marker to say to people, how come 15 Australian publishers approached uh, a relatively unknown and cantankerous Tasmanian academic and a completely unknown graduate student wanting to publish that manuscript in 1977. What was going on in the world? <laughs> because my thesis is that move forward to the uh, 80s, after 83 in Australia, I'd say, and the idea would have sunk like a lead balloon because we were we were into the Thatcherite, Reaganite, um, neoliberal revolution, even though we got that with a, a sort of a human face and a green tinge under the Hawke Keating Labor government. But nevertheless, you know, all of those ideas were sort of pushed on to the back burner. So in that sense, um, that timing uh, was there and... Bill Mollison had the energy and the, the boldness to leave his tenured position at the university and outside of academia take uh, permaculture to the world. Whereas I was very young and I didn't feel exactly like I had the grounded experience to sort of back all the interest that there was in this. So my interest was in if you like, doing permaculture yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, rather than talking about it or uh, whatever. And uh, so, yeah, to an extent, um, you know, I say uh, while uh, I and Bill Mollison were the co-originators of the permaculture concept, Bill Mollison was the father of the permaculture movement. And right from the beginning, it sort of really became a movement, uh, you know, which had all of the downsides of popularism, eco-fashion, all of those things. Um, but, you know, ideas get dirty as they leave um, the sort of um, Christine, the headspace uh, yeah. or uh, the academy and get into the real world. And they get dirty in different ways, in the same way that permaculture got dirty through becoming popularist and um, uh, just uh, practical grassroots uh, activity, um, sustainable development, you know, almost a decade later got very dirty by going straight into sort of global politics. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, yeah, that's a, a sort of complex history in the, in the origins of, uh, of permaculture. And, and, of course, in calling it, permaculture, which meant permanent agriculture as a foundation for any permanent uh, culture. And we were using the word permanent in lieu of the word sustain, the sustainability mm -hmm. concept mm -hmm. didn't exist. And it was referencing, of course, um, a visionary book from the 1930s by American agronomist uh, Russell J. Smith, uh, tree crops a permanent agriculture. Uh, this idea of enduring forms of um, cultivation based on perennial plants, tree crops, rather than the vulnerabilities of just uh, annual crops. Mm -hmm. But from the beginning, the 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 permanent culture was implicit um, in the concept. Yeah. Uh, we, we're going to have some more time to dive in into the, the concept, of course. Uh, what, what I wanted to, what you said also, how the, the concept originated in the 70s, and that was the right moment to do so, because later it might have been 
either diluted, shut it down, or many other elements. In the same moment, there was people like uh, Herman Daly with steady state economics. Um, yes. I think there was Kennedy who was critiquing growth back in the 60s, early 70s as well. Yes. So, so, so there was a ripe moment for these bold ideas. Uh, and somehow they, they put a lid on it for a number of years until they reemerged today. And permaculture today ha has an extraordinary um, success and welcome as well because it's felt as necessary. So we, we discussed about these you know, lulls and peaks or valleys and peaks about when it's ripe for some uh, revolutionary and uh, strong and bold ideas and when the system kind of plateaus and and flattens everything. Uh, you know, this idea of post-growth, degrowth, critique of growth mm. has known several phases. And in the 70s, yes. it was extremely interesting to read about that when politicians, US politicians talked about we should not aim for growth. I was I was <laughs> <laughs> really flabbergasted. So yeah. Yeah, it it, it is true where these things come in in cycles and I see the periods in between are opportunities for consolidating the ideas grounding the ideas proving what works sieving the grain from the chaff um, and then these pulses when there's adoption by another cohort of people another generation or um, uh, another uh, group and also when that becomes second generational, where people are, have already been raised, maybe when they were young in a family, where some of these ideas or related concepts were sort of part of the osmotic absorption environment, <laughs> uh, then people, when the signals change in society, those people who have those ideas are not so much struggling to grapple with them just at a conceptual level, but they actually have something of that in themselves ready, ready to go because these processes of deep cultural change don't just mm. happen out of some smart ideas. <laughs> <laughs> we, we always thought even, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That we're one article away or one policy away to, to change the world, <laughs> but actually, yeah, it takes some generations to do so. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's dive in a bit. I, I love the fact that you were looking at the intersection between these three elements, ecology, agriculture, and landscape design. Um, and you were saying that, you know, you could find combinations of twos, but not combinations of threes. And mm. does that already reflect your systemic thinking uh, about links, flows, stocks, ecosystems, yeah. so kind of having the academic jargon or grammar to to think about these and put them well, together? Yeah, I think it was partly intuitive and also coming from my upbringing because, uh, you know, my father's understanding of geopolitics when, you know, in history, that, you know, he left school when he was 14, but he is, you know, the, probably the most uh, significant thinker in early influencing me to sort of understand things that I now look back and say he was thinking systemically. Mm. And when I met Bill Mollison, you know, I my judgment was, ah, this person thinks in a way uh, what I called ecological thinking because all of the academically trained ecologists I'd met, uh, I had sort of somewhat arrogantly in my youth written them off as reductionists. They were bit people, <laughs> you know. They were really botanists and zoologists who, you know, ecology was the new thing, you know, and, you know, and they might have had a, a, a lot of knowledge, but it was bit knowledge, whereas when I met Mollison, I thought, you know, he thinks ecologically. Now, as I said, I didn't. He didn't have a label. I didn't know who he was. So I was already thinking hmm. in that way. Um, I can now sort of understand. It wasn't something specifically that I was trained in, even though there was a lot of those elements floating around in environmental design. 
Um, you know, for example, we had the colleague of EF Schumacher, George McRoby, was um, did three months teaching at the school uh, while I was there. So there were there were people who, in their different ways, were yeah were thinking systemically. And um, and so you mentioned that uh, there was these two elements, of course, the, the permanent element and the culture element. So permanent is kind of us to to stay over time or to subsist over time culture and activity that that helps human thrive um but there was this dissonance or as your colleague uh, bill was mentioning that how come agriculture is annual and you know forests or or perennial or was that the the yeah well so there was the seed of the idea that Mollison said to me in response to that question, this is what I'm interested in. He said, well, how about this for an idea? If most places on the planet, nature creates some sort of forest as its optimal sort of design solution, why doesn't our agriculture, if not literally look like a forest, function like a forest? And I thought, ah, yeah, that that is this is perfect <laughs> as a, a starting point, you know. Um, and so, of course, a lot of permaculture one was focused on how to design um, integrated perennial polycultures. But of course, there was a lot of other elements that were there too around polyculture itself, as opposed to monoculture within annual cultivation, the integration of animals and plants that in ecosystems, animals, you don't have animal ecosystems and plant ecosystems. And at least in Australian agriculture, we were familiar with the idea of animals integrated with crops, whereas already industrial agriculture in many parts of the world was separating those, those functions. And then the big one was the separation of human settlement from agricultural production and resource extraction. And of course, this is what um, uh, the the best synthesis of this, I believe, is uh, Sebastian Marrow's work in um, uh, architecture and agriculture taking the countryside, that these two fundamental activities of, uh, of shelter and habitation um, that we associate with the profession of architecture and the provision of basic human uh, needs from a working relationship with nature, uh, agriculture, that the separation of these two functions is actually at the core of the environmental crisis. And his tracking of the various uh, ideas and practices to bring those back together and recognising that that distillation, that permaculture is actually at a lineage centre of that reunification of of, of settlement um, and uh, and production. And if you look at that in just a direct practical way, that's in the household economy where people provide for themselves uh, starting at the, the back doorstep <laughs> where the, the garden farming extends from the built environment. So it's bringing those things right back literally uh, together in in some form, and that lineage run right runs right through to my, you know, more recent work on uh, retro suburbia, mm -hmm. um, because obviously urban form, uh, whether at small um, pre-industrial scale or post-industrial mega scale, um, at its involves some degree of separation of function. Uh, between the biological and the and the built, the technosphere and the ecosphere, but uh, in many places those lower density developments offer that sweet point where there's that intersection, where there's the a collective population big enough to provide um, some of the functions we associate with urbanity and and some degree of self-reliance we associate with the rural uh, in, environment. So how those things, you know, intersect is, is, was obviously, you know, central 
uh, to, to permaculture. But I think it's also important to recognize that, um, that from the beginning, um, permaculture was predicated on the assumption that the environmental crisis was fundamental and that the limits to growth were real and that uh, a steady state uh, outcome from the limits to growth was less likely and something that almost all commentators called some sort of collapse, uh, but I always uh, saw as some sort of decline descent, required some sort of re-ruralisation of society to some degree or other and a relocalization of the economy. Um, and that that's what distinguishes ideas like permaculture from the second wave environmentalism that got going in the late 80s, where there was a much greater confidence about uh, the technospheric um, sustainability uh, and that, you know, that all the world will be living in cities and mm -hmm. all of these assumptions and energy transition will enable all of these systems to transform, if not in some accelerated onward and upward phase, at least into some sort of steady state. And I see that as very much emblematic of mainstream sustainability emerging unconsciously mostly out of the sweet point of the final scenario of the limits to growth um, uh, model run where everything's appeared to move out onto uh, a steady state uh, uh, was certainly predicated in the 70s and then over the decades I've certainly articulated it as an adaption to a world of energy descent. Uh, and that that means there's some sort of differences or differences of focus from a lot of, you know, other, you know, environmental thinking, which has, you know, been predominant, certainly uh, emerging in the 90s and the 2000s. I, I think you, you put your finger on, of course, the... the the big elephant in the room, which are fossil fuels, cheap, fo abundant fossil fuels, uh, and how they they really tear tear apart cities and their hinterlands, or cities and and well, life in a broader sense somehow. Um, when we look at this two hundred two hundred year period, where uh, beforehand urine and manure was used in your backyard. Uh, and this became, you know, through fossil fuels, uh, nitrogen-based um, uh, fertilizers. Uh, when we had um, everything just a rock uh, throw away, and now we have trains, and then we got cars, etc., and pushed them back. Uh, where we had uh, certain types of plants, certain types of animals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we see that the disconnect grew further and further apart. The more we put fossil fuel in the engine, first coal, then petroleum, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So fossil fuel is really this, this uh, new system that, that changed our whole agriculture and current system. And you, you have this as a, as a critique, of course. How do we need to redesign our agricultural and current society without fossil fuels or this famous energy descent? And I think this is important to... Mm. To, to underline because you well you also critique growth in in that sense because fossil fuels enables long lasting or infinite at least in our mindsets growth it's not mm. <laughs> it's not a reality of course there there is uh, a point where we cannot go for, further not only because mm. of environmental but also societal issues so where did that so this energy descent um concept or idea was this based on the limits to growth uh, was it something that you experienced yourself also in the ag agricultural system where where did that come from and uh, how did you use it or mobilize it well we were seeing of course the adverse impacts of uh industrialization industrialization the, actually agriculture was the last human activity to be industrialized 
The first was textile production, and there were sort of massive gains in productivity uh, with that because it's basically a mechanical process. Um, agriculture was the hardest thing to industrialise, and it's really not till the second half of the 20th century in a lot of places where it starts to become industrialising because everywhere is so different. <laughs> you know, it's not amenable to this, you know, one size uh, fits all. And uh, the early uh, organic uh, movements around the world in, in Germany, in Britain, in the United States, quite independently of that, the early concepts of natural farming um, in, or nature farming uh, in Japan in the 1930s were starting to react against the impacts of uh, fossil fuel-based industrialization of agriculture. So there's that adverse impact, but there's also the inevitable, logical, these things are not renewable. So at some point they run out. Yeah. Um, you know, so how do you, what's the point of designing a civilization that should last for thousands of years based on something that's going to sort of disappear? Uh, and the assumptions, of course, about that were so often... Um, you know, in the 1950s, it was going to be nuclear power was going to be so cheap. And and the, the solar revolutionaries in the 70s were also saying, you know, we will have this limitless energy. So the understanding energetic realism and understanding the foundations of that has been sort of central to my work. And, you know, it's interesting that the first reference in Permaculture One is to Howard T. Odom's uh, energy, um, uh, um, environment, power and society, 1971. And that was hugely influential on me understanding this, how the world works, how nature works, how agriculture works, how the history of human evolution and culture operates according to energy laws and how energy can be used as both um a measure of things and is the driving force in any self-organizing process at any scale in the universe and understanding energy density uh, and those things are really the key to understanding uh, ecological literacy and any sort of sustainable design. So I think those ideas of the uh, were coming from many different sources, but for me, the most um, conceptually strong one was was Howard Odom's uh, work, and that continued to sort of influence my work. My book, uh, Permaculture Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability, is dedicated to uh, his, his memory. So in that sense, I was already in the early 80s having debates with colleagues who were focusing on urban development around compact urban form, trying mm -hmm. to get away from car-dependent Australian-American-style cities to more European uh, style. And I can remember those debates about a colleague who'd just come back from doing his PhD in Copenhagen and talking about row houses, you know, not necessarily facing the sun, just for energy efficiency and walkability. And I was saying, no, here, passive solar design, open orientation to the sun and having direct access to some land to grow food is actually more important. Now, one of those distinctions was a distinction between cloudy Western Europe <laughs> and sunny Southern Australia. Of course, yeah. Uh, you know, of a, just a very hard difference between 30% potential passive solar gain in, in Western Europe and 100% in Southern Australia. Uh, but another part of it was this energy descent idea that we will again have to produce perishable food directly where people live. We, um, Although we can transport grains and other uh, enduring things and uh, special uh, concentrates uh, over great distances if necessary, uh, perishable food needed to be produced 
where people live. And the most efficient way to do it is outside the, the monetary economy in the household and community economy. And so that meant lower density residential development actually makes a lot of sense. And so right there, you know, like I remember that discussion uh, and the person who was doing that, he was in his youth uh, and later a very active member of, of permaculture uh, Melbourne um, and he'd been a student when I was uh, sort of uh, um, doing visiting lectures at, uh, at his school and he became a very prom a very significant urban planner in Australia and obviously my more radical ideas didn't gain traction because there wasn't, you know, food and energy did not go radically up, uh, you know, as soon as we thought it would. And so without um, expensive food and energy, the environmental commitment to doing things is actually a very thin, um, dry, uh, a very weak driver. Uh, you know, without that need to do something. And we, I believe we are starting to get that shift now where structural inflation, the real cost of energy and food is actually rising. And although a privileged minority might not be feeling it, um, those things are starting to bite and they, they become strong uh, economic and then cultural drivers in in these things out of necessity uh, but of course a lot of our planning framework is completely in a different universe that that doesn't recognize or or see any of those uh, yeah. problems <laughs> well of course we're just 50 years or so too late in the in this problem and of course it was just as you mentioned because we managed to fix or some people call them the capitalism fixes to to lower the prices of foods or maintain them relatively low of energy and food. Mm. We, we found ways from the 70s, which were the energy crisis, to today to always make a small fix to keep them low, mm. to not actually act. Um, and I think this is one of the important elements that you use, which is the prospective element or the futurist's hat that you have which tries to say, okay, what if, what happens when food is, gets too expensive? What happens if we can have agriculture and settlements close once again? What happens if we mm. stop expanding, et cetera, et cetera? And I think this, mm. this prospective element that you have is essential. And I guess this is, of course, a logical element in systems thinking and also in, you know, uh, having a, an idea on the practical side and on the theoretical, but how do you use this uh, future thinking in your practice or in your designs as well mm. to, to inform you about, you know, how to navigate uh, the, the future, right? Well, I suppose there's uh, what I came to the conclusion sometime in the, in the 90s that, that the changes, although they weren't happening as fast as uh, we thought, uh, they were happening fast enough to be way in excess of the cycle time for redesigning and rebuilding our urban form, especially of our great cities, that that was a 100-year project to do that, even with rising net energy. Uh, so the turnover time of building stock, of infrastructure, all of those things meant we would be w deep into the energy descent fundamental uh, crisis, having to live with what has already been built in the fossil fuel era. And so what that meant is that ideas of the gleaming new green cities were not the actual cutting edge or the, the most important thing. And even projects that I've been involved in, like uh, rural eco-villages as a, a designer and a developer, you know, in a very small way. Uh, those were sort of learning cycles for some elements that could be applied in non-intentional communities where people just live. The recreation of community 
of geographic community out of these non-communities. And similarly, the, the retrofitting of buildings, the retrofitting of the biological landscape in with garden, garden farming, um, and the retrofitting of our own behaviour to make it fit for purpose. So that concept which was there in the energy crisis in the 70s, especially in the United States, of this going from cheap energy to expensive energy and needing to insulate houses for the first time and, and retrofit them to make them fit for new purpose, I think is a very powerful um, metaphor, but it's also suggests that the the key action is actually bottom up in community small scale rather than planned structural change from from the top i mean there's also been that for me a political priority to subsidiarity that always do things in society at the smallest scale at which it can practically work because it's more democratic more equitable and being very suspicious of centralization, globalizing forces that are trying to uh, amass the structures to a, a greater hierarchy and make decisions at that level. So that then you know, feeds into the very practical, mm. empowering aspect of permaculture, of people just doing stuff, not waiting for some government policy or corporate magic uh, wand of modelling the world we want by just living it each day and adapting what we have and accepting that things are not uh, perfect and we have to, in some ways, muddle our way uh, through the you know this crisis. <laughs> and, and as you say, I mean, we need to act at the same time as live because else we we're just gonna become crazy and imprisoned in this system and therefore you have these principles right these 12 permacultural principles in your opus uh where i think uh so i'm just going to read them and then we can uh um interact with them so you have number one observe and interact catch and store energy grow surf uh sorry obtain a yield apply surf regulation and accept feedback produce no waste use valuable and renewable uh, resources and services, uh, design from patterns and details, two details, apologies, integrate rather than segregate, use small and slow solutions, use and value diversity, use edges and value the marginal, and finally creatively use and respond to change. And I think some of them are very inspiring and and kind of can lead our everyday life that can help us a bit like mantras help us you know uh settle down and yeah. remember what we have to do because it's so overwhelming so complex that we don't know where to start when i read use small and uh, small and slow solutions okay i feel that we can start small i can think about manual labor and then figure out what we need more apply self regulation um, so frugality is kind of a mindset or cultural change that we need to include before anything else. And it, I feel it's also very similar to, you know, the leverage points of Adona Meadows, where you need to act at different levers and different levers have different, you know, uh, uh, can multiply the force that you um, um, put towards the system, right? And uh, so mm -hmm. how do you... So you have these 12 principles. I can imagine you, you when you give them or when you talk with people, you can give them for an ecological design, but also restructuring a, a household, as you, as you say, like a household life, but also in mm. wider systems. So these are, I think, from bottom up to larger scale uh, projects, no? Yeah, so they're really thinking tools into... Uh, the world of whole systems thinking. And in a sense, you can go through one principle and and sort of then that leads you into another. And also they are in dynamic tension, like the spokes of a bicycle wheel uh, with the ethics of uh, uh, care for the earth, care for people, fair share, which are universal in all traditional 
and Indigenous cultures of place in some form or another, uh, that they represent a hub and the 12 principles represent uh, spokes which are intention. So, for example, the two power principles, catch and store energy and obtain a yield, especially obtain a yield, it's really capitalism brought down to <laughs> the scale of one driving force rather than the only driving force where there's got to be something which is providing the net energy, the, the real uh, go to make something, yes, let's do that again, the positive feedback uh, and catch and store energy systems that actually store resources for lean times, that, that cope with the pulses, that invest thinking about the future and that those are balanced by uh the uh, self-regulation and accepting feedback negative feedback which is uh, like uh the brakes to balance the accelerator <laughs> in the car you know so that these things have various analogies that can be um uh, business analogies and mechanical analogies but of course mostly uh the modeling of these things come from how na how nature works and then also the basic intuitive design principles which governed all uh, Indigenous and traditional cultures of place. So a lot of these principles that, you know, a lot of permaculture when explained to often more traditional, rural, practical people, sometimes they, they say, oh, isn't a lot of that just it isn't common sense? That's or... just common sense. <laughs> and I say, yes, well, a lot of it is, but it's no longer common. Yeah. So there is an element where it's this rediscovery uh, for modern people embedded in the technosphere. How do we change our thinking? And so some of these things are a dynamic opposite to the prevailing one, like integrate rather than segregate. Well, the predominant design strategy in, in the industrial era has been to segregate things because they conflict with one another. You know, you put the housing over here and the industry over there because they make a mess when they're together, you know, and, and that was a response to fossil fuel and fossil fuel scale and, and yeah, the energy density of a, a steel foundry doesn't go very well with, <laughs> with uh, people. Uh, but, you know, that recognising that the prevailing pattern in all sustainable cultures and in all ecosystems is systems tend to be integrated, that symbiotic and complementary relationships are m the more common. Uh, but of course, there's always an element of competition and predation and and including segregation, you know, does exist in nature. Um, but it's 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 not the predominant way of doing things. And so similarly with small and slow solutions and diversity. You know, all of these things are about swinging the pendulum away from where the industrial mindset has, uh, has taken us. And that that is a deep, deep change uh, and uh, very hard often to, um, uh, to fathom. But, of course, these design principles don't give you solutions. They are sort of big, high-level things or things you come back to when you realise you need to go back to the drawing board and maybe you need to go back to the drawing board in some more fundamental way and think from first principles again. Uh, so, uh, but in their generality, they they can be universally applied. But of course, they, yeah, they don't give you the design answers, you know. Um, and, and that's what part of the critique that some people have said. Yes, they see the thinking behind those principles and for people who have some grounded knowledge in what they are trying to design or create, they make sense. But they might not, this is the critique, might not help people who know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this tension between theory, you know, of getting some abstract framework to guide you and just getting your hands dirty, just doing something you know, become embedded in what what you need to relate to, and 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 that pathway, and and they're obviously you know that theory and practice in dynamic tension.
in everything we do. Well, that's a perfect segue to go to practice then. Um, of course, you have done a number of uh, small, medium and big projects which have used these principles. Um, and I think it's very inspiring for the people that listen and watch because, you know, in, in this podcast, sometimes we we remain too theoretical. We, we discuss about donut economics, steady state, post-growth, critique to capitalism and all of that. But we we feel sometimes robbed of imagination. We we don't know what to do next, right? I mean, we know about universal basic income. We know about um, doing riots. We we know a, a number of elements about how to attack the system that is prevalent today. But we have we. It's difficult to also imagine what's the world that we want. It's it's as as they say, it's more mm. easy to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. So, I yes. I, I think it's important that we we also give some some empirical and practical um you know projects that have you know you have built over time and because a permaculture project is not you know you don't draw it and then the next year it's off the ground sometimes it takes many decades to to uh, thrive um there are a number of them perhaps we can go through uh well when i was in brunswick i think it was eight years ago or nine years ago i uh, I, yeah. I visited of course the Ceres park uh, which was fantastic one of the small islands of melbourne actually which y y y y <laughs> you look around and you don't understand where you are uh but of course there is where you are right yeah. now meliodora um so perhaps can you just give us a, a brief overview of some of the projects that are the most important to you then we're going to go more in details in Meliodora because I think it's a of course a, a flagship mm. project and what happens yeah. from the thinking to the doing like what are some of the um, you know steps yeah well I think uh, it, it, you mentioned series which is the sort of flagship project of the Australian city farms and community gardens movement and it started on a Uh, a 10 acre site of some of the worst industrial wasteland in in Melbourne that had been a quarry and a rubbish dump and uh, um, a bitumen batching plant and everything. And I was there in that early phase and and permaculture was one of the influential ideas. But it was interesting that, you know, the local government gave the organisation this 10 acres of urban land on a peppercorn rental because it was a disaster. <laughs> it was like, who could want this? Uh, and so I think it was emblematic of, of the sort of permaculture strategy of using what others don't see as having any value, you know, and whether that's picking up something that people have discarded on the street or, or finding wasted organic materials to create a garden instantly, the whole series project, uh, you know, that confidence that we could um, remediate uh, this, you know, toxic <laughs> landfill in a way that probably now you would you would say, oh, no, you know, like there were too, too many things that would say, no, you can't deal with a site like uh, this. And there's, you know, there was certainly a lot of naivety in the way some things you know, evolved in that project, but it was also where there was complete uncertainty about funding, about skill sets, about people coming and going of all different interest groups as in any community process. So rather than a grand design for the whole place, it sort of evolved organically. And, you know, there are many, many stories, including ones that I was in, involved with of, outrageous decisions, you know, like having to be made to put something where it was. And, and you know, I then came back to the project in 89 as a consultant looking at where it had already become something. And now the local government wanted some assurance that this was actually worthwhile and did it have a, a longer legacy. Uh, and so I think you know, permaculture has been just one of many ideas and uh, agents of influence 
that work through uh, a place like Ceres. So Ceres isn't branded as a permaculture project, even though they they have long running teaching of permaculture there. But it's it's been a an incredibly strong influence over the the decades, and I think that's one of the ways that permaculture has been very successful is through um, the influence of ideas and organisations that were perhaps um, a little bit more mainstream. Within the organic certification movement, for example, the uh, NASA organisation, it's called the National uh, Association of Sustainable uh, Agriculture in Australia, had a much more holistic a sort of permaculture lens to it than a lot of the other certification organisations. And it's no accident that the people who started that were actually quite strongly influenced by permaculture, you know, from the uh, early years. So, I, you know, I think there's those um, things where that, that type of um, influence um, and sometimes you know, not necessarily that credit coming back to permaculture as a result. Similarly, the, in rural Australia, the Australian land care movement, which is a very broadly based, originally spontaneous farmer initiated response to land degradation in the 80s that, that then got government support and, uh, and funding in the 90s. Uh, in various parts of Australia, permaculture was one of the influences in actually creating that, even though later bureaucrats in that system had no conception or knowledge of those uh, interactions. So I've been quite positive about those sort of informal um, uh, and organic processes uh, as much as things that are very conscious from you know, permaculture design and branded, if you like, in a, a movement sense as uh, this is uh, uh, permaculture. Um, and, and then, of course, I mean, there is the place where you are right now, Meliodora, um, which is kind of the um, an accomplished site, meaning that you, you have managed from design because from scratch to actually have... Uh, a thriving place where at least two or three persons sometimes or four persons sometimes live. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, there's often more. There's three semi autonomous households uh, <laughs> uh, here for the last um, uh, nearly a decade now. Uh, yeah, so, um, so the numbers fluctuate. <laughs> so, can, can you walk us through what, what happened when you and your partner came together, saw this place, or and what what were some of the steps? I mean, of course, it's a um, from what I've written here around one hectare of land. You have, um, from what I understand, you are in charge of the plants, and your partner is, <laughs> is uh, uh, in yeah. charge of the animals. And you have different zones. So you have the house, you have food plantation right right around the house, but also the orchard. You also have water catchment, water catchments, and studios, and all of that. But I guess this was not a master plan and let's go, we're going to do it in a couple of years. This was iterations. Uh, well, yeah, it was also a culmination of a decade of of, of mostly self-training as a permaculture designer and then the urgency of uh, uh, leaving Melbourne, my partner leaving her well-paying job, uh, her two teenage children and and then a baby on the way and my micro business as a permaculture consultant, uh, you know, that we needed to do things within uh, a limited budget, working without debt from savings and primarily to get those systems happening and me balancing that work of building a passive solar house, developing the property with uh, consultancy work that I was doing uh, with farmers and um, other landholders. So that balance between the monetary economy and the non-monetary economy of, of self-reliance, of being an owner-builder, 
working outside the system of, uh, of debt with um, frugal living and then developing that in, in a progressive way, but thinking long term of getting the, the basics of water supply, thinking about a drying climate in the mid 80s about what were the prospects with climate change of what would how would an area be affected that some of the most fire bushfire vulnerable regions in in Australia so all of that long term thinking and getting that basic infrastructure in place and without really a strong sense that we wanted to be completely self-sufficient or, as people say these days, off the grid. Uh (laughs) You know, uh, those weren't really objectives and yet we became more self-sufficient than pretty much anyone we knew and more embedded in living, modelling that permaculture way uh, of living. And the original idea was a small property, a modest property, which I... I thought this was small when I was in my 30s. It doesn't feel quite so small now that I'm in my late 60s. <laughs> uh, but that that would leave us free to put energy into larger projects um, in, the, in the region. And the, the two larger projects that beyond involvement in many other community activities, one was the informal community-based management of the common land uh, downstream of us in what we call the Spring Creek Community Forest, uh, which was a completely informal project. And the other was a much more formal project, that, which was within our region, the development of the Friars Forest Eco Village, which was a, uh, a full development approval infrastructure um, and all of the governance structures uh, so those were the two sort of somewhat larger projects that by having a property that was relatively modest, uh, rather than I saw a lot of people on larger farms, the whole project from a permaculture point of view was totally filled their, their whole life and their, uh, their work. And that's pretty much um, emerged. And I think the... the uh, Eco Village was also closely associated with my passion for sustainable forestry because it's a place where, which is unusual in Australia, where people with environmental disposition, uh, greenies are greenies with chainsaws and thin and manage the forest. This is very unusual in Australia, much less uh, uh, common than in Europe. Um, There's this great phobia about forestry being an impossible thing to do sustainably in Australia as a result of our history. Uh, so that that has been a big part of my work there. And with the, the local wild landscapes, all of my work uh, in relation to novel ecosystems and emergent ecologies, the management here that we've done without any government funding or any government approval just from the community doing things is as much an informal scientific research project to study what nature is doing. And so a lot of my work and writing has been around that 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 field of novel ecosystems of how nature itself is actually responding to human caused land degradation and creating new ecologies and that those are models from which we can learn to design ecologies, which is of course the original conception of of permaculture. We're gonna design an ecosystem. So how does nature actually go about this process? And it's much more informative to look at where she is working in real time than ancient co-evolved stable ecosystems they are not actually as informative as these new emergent processes in response to radical change and so that's been a a big theme in in my work at a theoretical level but it's also very directly related to practice of 
okay, how do we manage the places close to where people live so they're fire safe and they absorb water and purify um, uh, toxins and, and build soil and store carbon and all of those functions that uh, uh, we need. So there, those projects have sort of, you know, over the years had some degree of integration and connection because I have focused more strongly within a bioregion, even though I, you know, I have had some uh, travel and participation further afield, but uh, most of my work has been, you know, concentrated in this bioregion. So that gives the opportunity to sort of weave together many of the different uh, threads that are that are relevant and basically participate with like-minded people in our uh, community and many of them in our region there's a, a critical mass of people who have actually done um, some sort of uh, permaculture um, training through the permaculture design course which has been the, the main mechanism by which permaculture has spread so in this region it's not like uh, it's a, a sort of a permaculture bioregion, uh, but you know there's a lot of those threads in in different ways are expressed here, and and that's as a result of the work of a lot of people, um, certainly uh, beyond and independently, but also connected to the work we've done. Um, so we've talked about the permacultural principles and thinking and and let's say designing. Can you, uh, if it's okay with you, I would like to get a sneak peek of what is permacultural living. What is your everyday like? How do you live in a place which is designed with permaculture principles? What, what, what are the everyday things that you have to do, that you have to think? That What, what is your life like? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I suppose uh, my partner says about the house, uh, uh, passive Uh, solar it's passive solar design but active humans <laughs> you know you need to open the blinds and uh you know the vents and uh you know do the various things that make the machine of the house work and that that's a good thing that that humans need to do that rather than it all being run by computers <laughs> because you understand it and it's just part of the normal living uh pattern um it's just that the house is a much more powerful, efficient engine than the average house. But traditionally, every house needed to be managed for climate comfort. So some of those things uh, uh, are sort of, uh, yeah, become more empowered because of the permaculture design. Um, and similarly, uh, of course, with um, uh, food growing, Uh, and animals, uh, the seasonality, in the same way the house is governed by the, the seasonal cycle of the weather systems, all our activity is locked to the, the seasonal cycles. And that includes everything from, you know, when you plant things, you know, there is times to do stuff. Uh, and if you miss that, that window is gone for a year. You know, in the human technospheric control world, everything's sort of negotiable. You know, we can reschedule things. Well, dealing with nature is not like that. You know, you have to do things at a certain time and you have to be ready for stuff. And then that governs right through to my most far reaching work and influence in the world, like uh, any trips away have always been in the winter um, because we don't go away for any significant time in the summer because there is too much activity happening. And then most of our work has been home-based. So even before the internet, we ran a home-based business and that I sort of really saw my time divided about one third uh, paid in some way, uh, mostly as a consultant, but then progressively as a teacher and writer and public speaker, um, one third uh, in the household 
uh, non-monetary economy providing for our uh, basic needs and one third uh, sort of um, in the work in the wider community and permaculture networks that aren't paid that are just sort of contributing to some larger good. So that one third, one third, one third has sort of been the way we've operated a lot. Um, certainly Sue has been more strongly in the household economy um, and, and that was very much her preference. Um, and uh, uh, though she's also been involved in our business and our business has been home-based and then progressively as we had other people involved in that business, uh, they are often working out of our home office. And so we would have days where it's a, a sort of a business day and we now have days where it's a, a farm work day. So the three households that are resident here contribute to doing all the stuff that needs to be done with um, plants and especially with animals. With livestock, of course, it's non-negotiable. The, the welfare of those animals, it, it, uh, they are dependent on you. And especially with dairy goats that you know have to be milked and uh, all of those sorts of things. So that um, in a week, there's a lot of different things happening and they're all quite closely integrated. And a lot of people find that quite threatening or quite challenging where business and social relationships and basic things that often people think of as private hobbies are all a bit mixed together. <laughs> uh, and it was interesting, we had uh, a journalist uh, who was travelling on a bicycle to places like us. Uh, his book was called Changing Gears. And the piece he wrote about us here I was talking about home-based living. And as an urban person used to getting up in the morning and going somewhere else, that was what he found more challenging about our place than the compost toilet or any <laughs> of the other physical things. It was this idea that in the future, maybe most people will get up each day and more or less be at home or within walking distance. And that People won't sort of teleport themselves to some other place for the day. <laughs> and as an, a very urban person, he just found that really challenging. And, of course, for us, it's just like not just natural. We hate the idea of, of, of that you would commute anywhere. <laughs> uh, and so that was like for me a decision I think I made at a very young age. Uh, possibly when I was 17 years old, I looked at the whole commute lifestyle and thought, I am never going to do uh, that, that sort of world. So, yeah, but each time of the year, there's very different things happening because of that, um, uh, that seasonal cycle. So you integrate rather than segregate your your thirds of your life into one place. Absolutely. And our son has critiqued this. He says, he says we have gone too far <laughs> of muddling everything together <laughs> and the need to, um, no, that's business. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, yeah. So like what, what does a holiday actually mean? You mm -hmm. have a very rich lifestyle where you, you have a huge amount of autonomy of, uh, of, of self-control, uh, but you actually live with very limited frugal uh, consumption. I mean, as best we could model it about 10 years ago with the early ecological footprint modelling spreadsheets, it was sort of about a quarter of the Australian average or something. And living at that level and yet managing to maintain some sort of influence in the wider world because there's obviously a tension between living very simply and frugally and can you project if you like in some form power into the world well most people do that by 
consuming directly and indirectly large amounts of resources, including flying around the world and networking with uh, people. So we've sort of tried to make that, you know, that balance where there's not a means and ends uh, conflict is, uh, is so strong. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful example that a number of us aspire to figure out a new lifestyle as well. How do we get community uh, work with our with our own work and how do we get, well, just enough of paid work to do all of the rest that is important for us, for our community. And, mm. and I think it's a very valuable insight. And uh, I think you need that community as well for that. So in your, you mentioned yes. by region, which I think it's extremely relevant. So I had my, my, I told my friend, uh, Josh, that uh, I was going to talk with you. And he said, Oh, just, I I'm very curious about how do we upscale this, this uh, permacultural principles, so you mentioned bio region, but of course, in some places, uh, we 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 set this divide between you know Australia and North America and Europe, where in one place you have very dense urban cores, uh, and in the other you also have suburbia where you can implement very easily uh, permacultural principles. But I'm wondering how do you? I guess you have thought about it many times, but how do you envision this scaling up uh, either by mm. region in? Australia, Northern America, but what happens when you have a large concentration of urbanites? What what, what happens there? Yeah, well, I think there's there's two two things there. One one is that scale and and density, and there's definitely permaculture strategies and practices that uh, are relevant in in higher density places. And if you if you look at that simple idea of um, uh, of garden farming to provide a household's needs that strongly make sense at uh, both a rural and a suburban scale. And then you look at high density, although there are some opportunities for, you know, rooftop gardens and aquaponic systems and mushroom cultivation in basements and all sorts of different things. The basic thing that makes sense is a, a relationship between those people and uh, either uh, sort of community collective uh, garden spaces um, at urban fringe or the community supported agriculture model where there's a relationship to commercial uh, farmers. So obviously those both those intense urban forms of food production or the organisational relationship re involve more participants, more stakeholders, and greater organizational complexity and governance issues. And so therefore you're more working within the constraints of what the society provides or what its current rules are. Whereas in a rural area, there is still greater freedom to sort of do things that are really different from what the society thinks is proper and even legal. So permaculture is always navigating that space those gray areas between you know the formal and the informal the legal and the illegal and deliberately sort of pushing those boundaries but i think through my future scenarios work i think also need to recognize the large scale hardening top down uh, control structures which inevitably uh, we are subject to and are partially a top down response to the climate and the energy and the, the poly crisis. <laughs> uh, and that inevitably the structure of those things is more authoritarian and more of a command economy and uses the power of the corporations to do things. But in a parallel sort of shadow world, there's opportunities at the margins to do things outside of those systems. And so this is a very great difficulty for many activists and designers to come to terms with that that increasingly there's this divide that you're either in the system or you're out of the system and the ability we've had to cross over between these realms is actually getting harder and harder and the strategies that are actually being driven are actually quite 
opposite, even though they are both responses in their own ways to, if you like, the, you know, the poly crisis. Uh, so certainly from my point of view, permaculture has these opportunities at the fringes, whether that's the geographic fringes or the conceptual fringes, the informal economies, the non-monetary economies, um, and in the current world, of the move to digitization and control, if you like, the cash and informal monetary uh, economies. Um, and so some of those things from some perspectives are because um, uh, of dysfunction and gridlock in, in the top systems uh, and that some people attribute to um, dysfunction or evil, uh, but a lot of them are sort of just structural outcomes of that we are really already deeply in the crisis. So, you know, at the same time that we're talking about sustainability and um, uh, limiting resource use, you know, there's one of the highest energy wars going on in Europe at the moment, you know, destroying military equipment and and human lives on a giant scale and accelerating the military industrial complex to make lots more of the same stuff. So we have to accept, you know, the ambiguities uh, 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 of that sort of world at, at the large scale and at the small scale. So that at the small informal scale, there's the need to ethically deal with the issues and have an understanding of the larger picture, but there is a priority to survive and, and do one's own due diligence and to a significant extent, treat the larger system, understand that it is actually a threat uh, at the same time that it may be attempting to do things that are responding to the, the crisis. So, I see there's the, there's the scale thing and the density thing, but there's this overlay between the formal and the informal and whether people are putting their energy into one or the other. And people involved in permaculture often span across those two realms. Uh, but increasingly, I think for everyone, it's getting harder and harder to, uh, to do that. So a lot of the things that I see are huge creative opportunities in the gaps mm. to do things which are small models uh, and they don't change the larger system, but they set up working models under very difficult circumstances that potentially in the right conditions in the future uh, could, uh, could be uh, models for larger scale change. Um, and if that fails, then they're lifeboats in some form or another. <laughs> so uh, that's, <laughs> that's, I suppose, a summary of, yeah. uh, you know, how I see those, those dynamics working. I mean, yeah, we could talk about the pros and cons of, um, you know, uh, rooftop gardens and, <laughs> and whether ideas like food growing on vertical walls makes energetic sense and and all of those uh things and the um you know the the huge learnings that there are in soil ecology and enormous uh positive you know evidence base that's coming to support a lot of the principles of organic and regenerative uh agriculture but you know, some of these things, of course, are relevant to some people and for others, they are an abstraction uh, or they're not, you know, don't relate to where people are at. And that that issue of what is relevant to me here now and what is the message, um, getting used to the idea that context really changes everything. In permaculture design, it always depends <laughs> You know, and yet people, the mindset of the modern world is, oh, there's there's one big answer that sort of works everywhere. And that's very challenging for people to come to terms with how 
whether it's a household or whether it's a piece of land, uh, the context is uh, needs to be what what shapes the emergent design. Mm -hmm. No, of course, it's an impossible question, and that's why I I want to have your your wisdom kind of on this because it's also a, a matter of societal justice because most of the people that are the less um, fortunate are going to end up in cities within the system and then get trapped. And so I think permaculture might be this this way out. How do you welcome people, or what what is the approach to get people on board in permaculture for for people who are not necessarily interested in or you know did not have the privilege to understand the the vastness of the environmental challenge and also why we should act i mean a number mm -hmm. of people just are in everyday uh you know struggle and they, they don't have the the luxury to see outside of their everyday struggle right and i, I can imagine mm -hmm. that this is also the urban versus not urban it's i'm not saying that rural lifestyle is flowers and you know uh, everything mm. is great right but at least you mm. can make a subsistence for yourself and your household sometimes and the mm. urban words you are very much trapped in what you mentioned you know this top-down system so how do you welcome yeah. underprivileged communities and uh, people in in this uh world? yeah well i think there's there's the recent movement of people into cities on an accelerated scale, the biggest of which, of course, has been in China. Uh, but it's part of you know the process of urbanisation that's been going on for the last 500 years. And when people make that new move, and it's often um, carrot and stick, they're drawn by the attraction, uh, and it's also the stick of the enclosure of the commons, the uh, war and uh, uh, dispossession that drives people that uh, from the non-monetary economy into the household economy and out of territory that one is familiar with to territory one is unfamiliar with, um, those people are often in quite difficult situations still often have the skills of poverty and have the some innate intelligence of self-organization uh, and although people can be in the worst of circumstances i've been uh, more aware of what's happened in the long affluent countries where you get generations uh, of people who have only known wage work or social welfare work and don't have the skills of poverty don't have any connection to nature don't remember, don't have any cultural memory of any of those things. And this is the poverty that's emerging very strongly in places like the United States uh, now. And it's a different sort of poverty um, and a different sort of difficulty because, you know, people have been eating junk food generationally. Um, and we know now from epigenetics that what your grandparents were eating is actually you know, shaped your body. So th these uh, are sort of very different types of um, disadvantage compared with people, I knew stories of people who'd moved into Jakarta, Indonesia in the uh, boom and, um, you know, living in uh, slum settlements. And then when the uh, the developers uh, the development economy stopped, they immediately started just growing food because they weren't being threatened by the police with, you know, having their places bulldozed. Uh, and they may have lost their jobs on construction sites, but they went back to Cousins Farm in the village and helped out, you know, because they still had that connection. Whereas a lot of people, that world is completely uh, lost. So building those... Uh, those on those sorts of from those sorts of disadvantage has been actually a common aspect of permaculture projects in in many places and sort of in that sense that becoming like remedial holistics for people who've been uh you know failed in the system the system of consumption as the system is gradually pushing more and more people off and now 
since uh, COVID rapidly accelerating the destruction of the middle class. So those, those situations are really very, very challenging because they're also overlain by a whole lot of um, culture wars, um, uh, subculture conflicts, uh, and, and I don't think permaculture has been necessarily any better at navigating those those difficulties. Uh, the permaculture uh, movement has been subject to those same uh, problems. But dealing with people's real uh, problems and issues is, is I think, the, the, the real uh, focus and challenge. And that's a challenge I give back to people involved in permaculture too. It's great to have a lovely biodiverse garden with all sorts of, you know, uh, wonderful herbs and uh, and uh, uh, plants, but where's the the basic things that uh, people relate to that that they want to eat, and where's you know the knowledge of uh, wild foraging, um, rekindling those skills, um, the skills of how to how to have um, uh, uh, using waste fuel to have a fuel efficient uh, cooking uh, stove. So a lot of permaculture has been focusing on these very basic things and introducing those things to people who've never had any experience of those things, but have, have been dropped out of the system at, at, at the bottom. Um, but I think that is um, really uh, challenging and it's um, you know, because, you know, we're often starting from scratch. But the other recognition is that a lot of uh, those people of disadvantage have been struggling often for generations. And like Aboriginal communities in Australia, they are battlers and survivors who are used to chaos and all sorts of conflict. And as Bill Mollison said to me about Aboriginal people, he knew so many of them, this was back in the 70s, walking around with illnesses that would have you or I in hospital, but they are still out there surviving. So that is actually a sort of a quite counterintuitive thing that comfortable, well-educated, middle-class people who understand a lot of the issues are often so cocooned in a world, so comfortable, that any sort of stress, um, any sort of rupture, they are actually more vulnerable. And a lot of the, the battler communities still have that somehow that survival instinct that can be rekindled in obviously very nasty ways, but can, can be rekindled in very positive ways as well. So I think it's a sort of a very mixed story as mm. who other people of dis you know uh, um Dispossess, disadvantage. disadvantage yeah, yeah. And, and of yeah. course well sorry we went a bit into a dark place but i think it's where it's an important issue to 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 cover and of course you have created many educational uh content books uh trainings online so if you go to to your website homegren.com.au you will be able to find a number of these resources and just go on YouTube and type permaculture. You, I think everyone will find an abundance uh, of of elements, also of stories. Perhaps stories might help uh, the people that are listening to us to to take up some of these skills, also to rethink uh, and see how the lifestyle change of some of these people. Because I think that's what's the most engaging or the most um, and acting is to see how your friend, your colleague, your your parents change their lives and live uh, better, and have managed to 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 grow food. I think growing food is really one of the things that there you have a sense of pride and you have a sense of fulfillment and safety uh, in this unsafe world. So I think really just dive deeper into this. We're gonna start wrapping up. Um, is there um, a message that? Well, in your, let's say, 50 years of 
uh, intellectual pursuits and practice, you 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 came across and say that okay, after me looking at all of this, I, I tend to say the same thing over and over again. Is there something, an advice <laughs> or a message that you see yourself saying to 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 new persons or to relatives uh, that is kind of your sentence or expression that you always kind of say? Well, I think connecting to nature through a practical way, like growing food that has just relates to our animal nature and our ancestral nature so much is remains one of the most powerful ways to experience the abundance of nature and the resilience of nature ra rather than the constant story of nature's fragility and nature falling apart and and nature withering away and that we are part of uh, of nature and so whether it's my uh, reading landscape work or the the focus on food production at home uh, not just for its practical uh, benefits but for its psychic mental health uh, benefits and especially with children to expose children at the youngest age at the beginning from babies to that world and connected to that is the most important thing uh, for the future. And it's a it's a joyful thing from amazingly simple things that are surprisingly uh, available to a lot of people in all sorts of small uh, small ways. Uh, so I think those that message is still uh, you know, one of the most powerful ones uh, to to deal with the world that we're facing. And uh, any last recommendations about uh, books or films or articles? I mean, of course, there is your books, Permaculture One, The Principles of Permaculture, um, Retro Suburbia. We mentioned Howard T. Odom. Is there anything that uh, that you read or you watched that really inspired you into thinking about this future um, well, you want to aspire to. Interesting. At the moment, I'm a, a judge on an environmental film <laughs> festival, <laughs> and I'm not a great uh, connoisseur of, <laughs> of films, but I've been looking at um, through ten uh, international feature films. It's an India-centered uh, um, uh, film festival, but there's one category for international films, and I've just watched a film called uh, uh, Planet Earth, uh, Planet Soil. Uh, and it's all uh, it's Dutch, um, and it's all examples from Dutch, uh, from the Netherlands, and it's extraordinary of the the emerging science of soil ecology and just phenomenal um, micro world that uh, um, permaculture and kindred people have been discovering both directly through uh, how to work with uh, soil life, but also the science of it as in incredibly inspiring film. So there's uh, something that uh, uh, people might like to uh, follow up. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, David, for this discussion. Thanks as well to all of you listening, watching until the end. Um, and of course, please just share this with friends that that are either trapped in this situation and want to feel like a, an escape or that they are already knee deep in permaculture and they want some more inspiration. Um, I would also highly encourage you to watch some other um, episodes with um, Herman Daly on steady state economics, Carlin Still on, you know, the, the, the history of agriculture and cities uh, to enrich what we mentioned again. And yes, once again, Thanks so much, uh, David. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Great to talk to you, Steve. <laughs>